uh, our talk is going to be on uh, move semantics, uh, stood move, uh, and when should you move and when you should not. So uh, th this talk is aimed uh, mainly for beginners, um, but yet I, I do find that many people struggle with move semantics. So even though it started many years ago, I mean in C++ 11, that we some call uh, modern C++, it is with us for more than a decade. And, and I think that this is a good time to make sure that we get all the details. So it is going to be a very interactive session. Uh, I would like to get your uh, answers on some of the questions. And I will take questions during the uh, talk itself. So feel free to put questions in the chat or in the Q&A, uh, but mainly to answer our questions when they come on Move Semantics, of course. So uh, let's present myself shortly. I'm a lecturer at the Academic College of Tel Aviv Yafo and Tel Aviv University, a member of the Israeli ISO C++ national body, co-organizer of the core CPP uh, conference and meetup group, and developer advocate at Incredibuild. Uh, um, two slides on Incredibuild. Uh, we do build acceleration. So if you are suffering from slow CI pipeline, especially in C++, uh, but also in your um, testing or other parts of your CI, then talk with me. Um, my email appears at the last slide. So if you want to get the email, you would have to stay with me till the end. Um, Incredibuild, um, very good product for being more efficient in your CI pipeline. Uh, in the past year or so, we invest much in uh, automotive uh, uh, tools in, in the environment for automotive. So um, accelerating the build pipeline for um, all developers work in automotive environment, uh, which um, is embedded, uh, Linux dist distributions for embedded. Uh, so again, if you are there, please feel free to speak with me. The motivation. So the motivation is to have more efficient code. And I guess that we all know, but if not, this is the slide to start with, that in some cases in C++, before we had move semantics, we paid for redundant copies. So suppose that we have some kind of a factory that can return Godzilla's and support that let's suppose that uh, we have a function called create frightening Godzilla and this function uh, can create uh, of course Godzilla's but it creates it locally so uh, there is a Godzilla created on the stack and the function returns it now when the function returns the Godzilla we actually get a copy of the Godzilla uh, from the function and then we copy it into g1 and you can see that there are some redundant copies here so some of the copies would be uh, elided, will be waived by the compiler, but it might be still that we may get a copy by creating G1 from a temporary that was returned from the function. And we may use the return value and like steal its assets or maybe a better word or a nicer word, move its assets. So instead of taking the object that the function returns and copying, maybe we can do something a bit more efficient. We have the same issue on the third line uh, when we call assignment and we get back a local, a local variable that was returned from the function. Then we call the assignment, which actually in, in many cases do deep copy. So allocate resources, copy the resources from the right side, but the right side is an object that is going to die. And instead of taking, uh, copying its assets, maybe we can just take them, like move them. So this is the uh, motivation for move semantics. The third option, the third uh, um, uh, example here is calling pushback. So uh, when you use standard library containers, you send something to the container, anything that you send is going to be copied. So this is how pushback works. This is how insert works. This is how the standard library containers 
work. So when we send the Godzilla here, even though it is a temporary, we may have a copy created on uh, the call to pushback. And again, we want to avoid this copy. So even if there is a need to create another object on the other side, instead of copying the content of this sweetie, we may be able just to take its values, its content, and avoid the deletion of this temporary. So this is the idea behind move. Um, and, and then after we implement move, we want to, to ask, did we actually call the move functions? So we would not here uh, today implement the move constructor and the move assignment. I assume that you saw it somewhere. If not, you should um, take it after, the, after this session. But let's take a, an example. Suppose that I have a constructor for class A, and the constructor is taking a string, in this example, by value. And then I do take the string that you got and copy it into a data member. Or another example, I have a B class, and in B's constructor, I'm getting an R value of a string. And then again, I'm taking this string that we got as an argument and passing it to the data member name. And the question to you here, and again, this is an interactive session, so now it is your time, is what would be called? I mean, A, B, would they call the copy constructor of string, the move constructor of string? Um, is it the same case in both? What is your answer? You can post your answer in the chat. OK, maybe one more. Maybe someone doesn't think that it is C. Well, we got uh, all answers as C, and, and this is indeed the answer. And, and the, the reason is, is that once you have a name, uh, and the name is not just because this is the name, but uh, the variable is identified by a name, then it is considered to be an L value, even if you got it as an R value, or even if it is a local argument. So even though we may move from it, because we are the last that are going to use this variable, okay, uh, we still we still copy in both cases. So since we do copy in both cases, um, it is not the best way to do. So what we want to do is to use std move in order to cast it to our value. So we actually say, okay, um, compiler, you just treat it as an L value because it has a name, but I actually want to use it as an R value in order to move. So let's call std move, and this is the use case for std move. This is the classical use case. I mean, I know that I can move, but compiler, you think otherwise because you see that I have a name and it might be that I would use it later on. So I can tell the compiler that, okay, I want to treat it as an R, it as an R value, which then would call the move constructor of string. Uh, what is being called in the next one? So I have a constructor for A. I'm getting a const string by ref. Then I do std move, which I should not. I mean, don't move it. I mean, the, the, the user just sent you something that he may use later on on the caller side. But you, we, we still did move, which is not a good thing to do here. But then the question is, what would happen? Maybe you would move, or maybe you would copy, or the code would not compile, or maybe it is compiler dependent. What do you say? Please cast your answer, please cast your votes on the chat. A few more votes, please. Uh, if you're not sure, take a guess. Okay, thank you for the answers. And the answer is copy. And the reason that we would have copy here, which is like a pure luck in a way, it's not a pure luck, these are the rules. But I mean, you did something wrong. If you would move here, if you would call the move constructor, then you are in a, in a trouble. And the reason that you would not call the, call the move constructor is because name was const. We got name as a const. So we actually cast to our value. But move preserves 
CV, const volatile. So it preserve, preserves the constness of the variable. So we actually get here a const our value. And since we have a const our value, const our value cannot be moved. Um, because in order to move, you need to take the assets and put null PTR in pointers, like make sure that the other one would not delete your assets after you took them. So if you just want to remember the rules, uh, there is a very nice table that I took from Stack Overflow that shows who can go where. So in our case, in the previous slide, we have a const our value because the casting to our value with std move preserves constness. So we could have be in the fourth row, which is a const our value case, but usually this is not implemented. I mean, you couldn't actually move from a const. So there isn't any real reason to implement the fourth. And indeed, string did not implement any constructor that gets something like that. The move constructor signature uh, resembles uh, row number three. So once you have a const our value for some reason, then it is a fallback, you, you fall back to the copy constructor. So this was the case there. It, it doesn't mean that it is okay to move something that you are going to use in a moment or, or the user is going to use. Don't do that. In some cases, it may fail. Okay. Um, so um, you may want to make sure that if you move, it is not on a resource that might still be used later on. So this is not a good thing. But in some way, if you say, oh, but I, I saw that it works correctly. I mean, it didn't call move. Okay, there is a reason because it was const. Okay, so we got that. Um, is it valid to std move an L value reference? What do you say? Can we move L value reference? And the answer are, answers are, it will not compile or maybe it compiles with a warning or maybe it will compile, but it's undefined behavior or yes, it can be legit in some cases. What do you say? Again, please cast your votes. I see a lot of B's and C's, a lot of B's and C's and a few D's. So let's go for the answer. And the answer is D. Yeah, you can move from L value reference. And in some cases you do, like for example, swap. If you want to swap two variables, you get them as L values and you steal from them. You move from them, why? Because once you know that LHV would not use its value, I'm going to override its value. So if you are going to override its value anyhow, then you know, I, I can move from it because you would not use your value. I, I'm going to override you. I'm using you, but I'm using you in order to override the old value. So it is perfectly okay to move from an L value reference and, and the compiler is fine with that. It, it is just a casting to our value. The compiler says, if you want it to be our value, that's fine. And then you actually move. So this is a call to the move constructor and this is a call to the move assignment. And we do that when we actually call swap. By the way, when you just move to C++11 from C++03, for example, you instantly gain performance just by this move, because if you call swap, so your call to swap remains the same call to swap, but you then call to the C++11 version of swap that does this magic of using move. And if inside you just swapped two vectors, then instead of swapping vectors by copying them, you swap the vectors by moving them, which is much more efficient. And you get that by just, you know, moving from 03 to C11 or later without changing anything in your code, just by using std swap and std vector in their C11 version. Let's uh, have. Um, another one, be cautious with passing by value. So there is some recommendation saying that since C++11, it is okay to pass by value because you can then take what you passed and move it. Now, in some cases it is okay, 
but in most cases you can do it a bit more efficiently. So um, the alternatives would be either to implement two functions, one for the L value case and the other for the R value case, or to have one using forwarding reference. And in fact, um, our Dinant has a talk about that, that the link to the talk is in the previous slide, showing or discussing the um, advantages of having two functions or a single function with a forwarding reference using std forward. And std forward would say, okay, if the forwarding reference here is an actual R value, then pass it with std move, then do move. The std forward is a conditional move. But if I actually got here an L value, because this double ref here is not an R value, it's a forwarding reference. It might be an L value, it might be an R value, so it serves both in a way. And std forward is a conditional move. It would move if I actually was an R value. So these two would behave a bit better. Um, and, and this is what would happen. If I only get it by value, if you send L value, you uh, pay for the copy because I insert. Okay, you, you, you maybe needed a copy, uh, but suppose that uh, the item exists in the, in the set. Oh, if the item existed in the set, I, I do not need to copy because you know, I just see that the key exists. So I can just you know, avoid the copy. So the L value that gets in and the key exists in the set, I can just avoid the copy if I get it as an L value and not by value. So by value, do the copy anyhow. And in all other cases, I uh, just avoid that. But if I get a const reference and you actually send an R value, then I pay for, for the copy of the R value because the function cannot take the R value as an L value. So you actually pay for a copy when you pass it on, when you pass it on to uh, the in call to insert, okay? When you call insert here, so yeah, I, I got the R value, but then I have to copy it inside. So eventually, if I just want to move the R value and to not do anything here, uh, both options would be the best. You can see it in the code here. Um, What's wrong with this one? We are going to the next example. I have a plus operator and my plus operator uh, gets two strings and I want to concatenate them. So let's assume that I have some kind of concatenation code here. And at the end, I just move back the local variable that I created. And the question is, what is wrong with this one? And the answers are nothing. The code is fine. Or you are returning a dangling reference, or maybe there is a performance issue, or the code doesn't compile. So what do you say about this function? Again, assume that there is some kind of a concatenation logic there, and what would happen there? Is it okay? Or maybe something is not so good. I will give you a few more seconds. I know it is fast. You have to think fast here. So in three, two, one, I will reveal my answer. And the answer is that you have a, a dangling reference. And the reason for the dangling reference is because you are returning a reference. This is a, returning a reference for something that is local. I mean, I do not copy, I do not move. I just say, let's return the reference. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's you know, a local reference, so I return it as an R value, but you cannot return a reference to a local. So if you try to do things here a bit more efficient, you're not doing that. Anyone wants to see the actual dangling reference? We have a link to the code here. So do you want to see the dangling reference happening or um, you, okay, let's, let, let's take a look at the, at the dangling reference. I see the answers of the yes, which are on the previous question of whether do you, you see me. Let's take a look at the dangling reference. 
So um, this is the example, okay? You see it here. Thank you for the reactions. Um, you should see my compiler explorer, I guess. Let me see if this is the case. Um, maybe for that, I have to stop here the presentation. Okay, yeah, you see the Compiler Explorer now. And I have here a string that I just created in order to create the plus operator. Okay, so um, in order not to have to implement the entire logic of string, I just inherit from std string. And inside, I imp implement the plus by calling the plus of my parent. Okay, so I'm calling the plus of my parent here. You can see it at line 16, the plus operator, and uh, at line 17, the call to my parent. And when I stood move and return by uh, our value, actually the program crashes, the program crashes, I get a warning here in GCC that I'm trying to return a local variable as a reference, but I do crash. By the way, you may crash or you may not. Crashing is not something that is uh, guaranteed, but you are doing something wrong. It is undefined behavior to return a local by reference. So this is the crashing example. Don't do that, you would crash. Getting back to the slides. So, um, what's wrong here? We try to amend the previous example. We try to have it as, okay, uh, so let's return by value. I mean, I understand. I cannot return a reference to a local variable, even not an R value reference to a local variable. You should not do that. By the way, in the previous slide, you should not do that. And there is a link to Stack Overflow asking, is there any case where you would return a link uh, sorry, uh, 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 R value reference. And somebody there is answering the question in Stack Overflow. Most great answers for R value and move semantics questions in Stack Overflow are answered by the man himself, Howard Inant. So if you go there, there is an answer by Howard Inant, the man behind the great idea of R value and move semantics, which is great. Even if you go now and ask a questions about that and it is new, it is not a duplicate, you would get an answer most probably for, from our Dinant on the subject. So you can later on browse this link. I would, of course, put the slides in the proper link. Uh, so again, we amended the example and now we return by value. What is wrong here? And the answers are nothing. The code is fine. Or we still return a dangling reference or there is a performance issues, or code doesn't compile. What do you say? So, the answer is a performance issue. And the performance issue is a pessimization that avoids RVO, or in our case, NRVO, return value optimization, or named return value optimization. The compiler, in many cases, is able to see that we return a local variable and do, um, this is a rule of implicit move on, um, so again, let, let me separate it into two. Even if we do not do std move, there is an implicit move on a return of a local by value. So the std move is redundant. Even without that, you are moving. No need for std move on a local variable that is returned by value. It would happen anyhow, but there might happen something which is even, even better. The compiler is able in some cases to see that you return a local variable that is not being used anymore and to say, you know what? I would create the local variable exactly where the return value should be created on the stack or exactly where somebody is taking it even better, in, in which case it would create the variable on the place where it is going to be used in such a way that it does not have to be moved. So we actually um, 
have a better performance by even not moving, just by, it is called return value optimization or named return value optimization if the variable has a name. So uh, RVO or NRVO are better. Let's take a, a look at the code. Um, so a very similar example that, to the one that we saw before, but here I have uh, by value return type and I do stood move inside. And I see that I, I'm calling the move constructor on the return. I'm calling the move constructor. I'm calling the move constructor, yeah. Be because it's a move. But if I would remove the move, okay, bear with me for a moment, I'm removing the move, okay, there is no constructor. I mean, I mean, you just got the low world back without constructing, uh, I mean, there is an, a call to the empty constructor, to, sorry, to the constructor that creates the string, but um, then there isn't any constructor on the way out, okay? So you can see that once I remove the call to std move on the local variable that is being returned by value, I am becoming a bit more efficient. I mean, move is quite cheap, but there is something cheaper than cheap, which is if you pay nothing. Nothing is usually better than just cheap. So um, we would prefer having this over calling to move. So uh, the answer is, yeah, there is a performance issue. Uh, the proper way is not to move and to return by value. So there is an implicit move on the return of a local variable by value. It should say here, if it is returned by value. Uh, and this would happen here unless the compiler say, you know what, I, I even not need any move, I can just do RVO or NRVO. Uh, Let's take the next one. What is wrong here? I have a stack. In the push function, I get a T and I forward, forward T inside the vector. So the stack is implemented using a vector. And since I use uh, the vector, I see a question there on the previous slide. I would take it in the, at the end maybe, if we would have time. Uh, the stack holds a vector and I push back uh, the forward of T because it seems maybe I got it as a forwarding reference. And the answers are um, the T double ref in push is not a forwarding reference, thus it will be a compilation error. Or maybe T double ref is not a forwarding reference, thus we support only push of R values. Or push may add to the vector a dangling reference maybe. Or D, push may inefficiently copy when it can move an item into the vector. What is the actual problem that we have in this code? In the meantime, I can answer Stefan's question on the previous case. If you do a std move on a local variable returned by value, then the compiler might maybe think, oh, there is a better way to do that, but then it falls into the rules of, um, I think the compiler is not allowed to avoid the um, casting or the, call to the constructor. So the rules of when the compiler is allowed to do RVO or NRVO may uh, not allow the RVO or NRVO in the case that you call std move because it's not the same type that you are returning. So there is a need like to go to the constructor in order to construct, to create the return value. And then you go to the move constructor. So uh, it's, it's not optimization, I guess, but more of that obliging, obeying to the rules of, of the standard. So let's go back to this example. Um, and I see that uh, some are uh, amending their answers. You can still do that, that's fine. And the actual answer is B. Uh, the double ref here is not forwarding reference, even though it looks like that because it's a template, but I already know T when I call push. I mean, T is not the direct template parameter of me. It is a template parameter of the stack. So uh, once T is already known, then okay, it's like, oh, it's int or it's a string. I know what T is. And then this is our value. And if this is our value, it means that we actually do not allow calling push with L value because L value cannot go into a function that expects an R value. It is afraid of being, you know, moved from. 
he heard some rumor that if he goes there, somebody can steal him. So um, our value would get in, but L values would not. So the proper way is to just have them both. Or, or if you do not want to have them both, you can implement one with a real folding reference saying, okay, I'm a template function expecting some U. And now this is a folding reference. I may have some requirement on the U that it would be convertible to T. Otherwise, I may get compilation or inside. Maybe I prefer it to be checked outside. Um, there would not be any other match. So if this fails, um, I would just not have any other pro possible function. But still, I may want to write that. And then this pushback can use forward. This is the second option of achieving the same. Let's go to the next one. What is wrong here? I have a uh, stack, the same stack with a vector, same thing. Now I'm in the pop function. And in the pop function, I want to pop something and then get it, get it back to the user. And I get it back from the back function. Now the back function just returns the value. It doesn't uh, erase it from the vector. So I call back, then I call pop back in order to erase it from the vector, and then I return E and don't answer, oh, the std move here is redundant and is pessimizing because um, you would not be able to do RVO. No, I'm not returning a local variable that is returned by value. This is a reference. So if I would just return it as E, there isn't any implicit uh, move on a return of a local reference, it's a reference. So if you do want to move here in this example, you should call move, but still there is an issue. And the answers are pop returns a dangling reference or pop moves from a dangling reference, code would be okay without the call to stood move. Or pop as an undefined behavior, moving out from a vector is impossible. Or the reference E is being invalidated once we call pop back. Now the differences are quite subtle. I mean, all answers almost say the same thing, but it is not exactly the same thing. There is a problem here. What is the exact problem? Is the problem with uh, the return value of pop or uh, maybe B is a better answer? Try to pick the best answer. I see there are a lot of Ds. Okay, so the answer is indeed D. And the, the reason for D is when we call pop back, the element that we got by reference is invalidated by now because uh, pop back called its destructor. The destructor was called here. Then you cannot return it, not with move and neither without move. You just cannot return E as is because E here, even if you try to copy from it, yeah, I would, run, I would return a copy, or uh, um, a, a move, uh, but, but a copy, a move of uh, of something that was invalidated in the previous statement is not something good. Don't do that. So no, no, it's not the way to go. Now comes the question: Can we move back a value from a popped value from a vector? What do you say? Can we do that? Is it possible to? I mean, we can copy out of the vector if I would just. Uh, use instead of the reference here, instead of the reference, maybe it would be better. But then if I remove the reference here, then immediately here I'm copying. Like this call to back copies into E. Then maybe I move out. But maybe is there a better way? I, I can remove the ref here, but then still I'm copying. I'm copying on the first line. Back without the ref would copy into E. Is there a better way? Yeah, I see a proposal by Kira. Thank you. I would do that. So we could say, let's take the back and move it into E. Okay, now I used move. Then pop back, you can distract it. And then when you return E, here, don't do std move. Here comes again the rule saying, do not call std move on a local variable returned by value because it would be pessimization. I mean, it has implicit move anyhow, 
but you still want the compiler to consider an RVO, return value optimization, or named return value optimization. A side note, implementing move for getting no accept. If you do implement your own move, don't forget the no accept keyword on the move constructor. Um, there was a question, is VEC back already in our value? So when we call VEC back, do we get here an R value? And the answer is no. We get back um, an L value because uh, the value is still alive. In, in it, it is more efficient to, to take it in, as an L value. This is how it is implemented uh, by vector because vector can return it as an L value because back is not pop back. I mean, back is, can I get the last one, which is still in the vector? Yeah, you can get it. I will give you the back as an L value. You can even change it. And then you change the value inside the vector. So it's, it's um, in a way, yeah, it's like uh, dereferencing the uh, last one, the R begin. Thank you, Kira, again. Uh, so let's go to the side note. The side note said, implementing move for getting for uh, no accept is costly. So uh, if I have a move constructor and I forget to do the no accept, then if my object is sitting in a vector and the vector is being uh, resized, um, I need more capacity. I, I, I need a bigger size and, and the bigger size requires more capacity because I don't have enough capacity, then I need to reallocate. And then when you reallocate, I mean the vector reallocates for you, then if the elements are trivially copyable, if they are trivially copyable, then they are just copied with mem CPY, mem copy. But if they are not trivially copyable, then there would be a loop. And the loop would either move them or copy them. But the, move, the, the, the loop cannot move them if the move constructor is not saying that it will not throw an exception because the, the, the vector is a bit afraid. If I would move elements to the new allocation and one of the elements would throw an exception during this move, then I'm with part of the elements in the new allocation and part of the elements still in the old allocation. Now I can propagate the exception to the user but the user would lose his old allocation, his old vector. He would say, okay, no, uh, never mind. I would not push back. I would not increase. And then I say, no, 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 it's a bigger problem. I just ruined your vector. And then the user would be upset. So instead of moving, because I cannot move back, I mean, then uh, an exception can be thrown again. Instead of moving, I would copy. This, would, uh, uh, this is what the vector would do because when you copy, an exception can be thrown also, but then I still have all the old elements in the old allocation, which is good. I mean, okay, you can use it. Uh, you can throw, propagate the exception to the user, but he still, she still has the original vector. So if there isn't any no except, the, comp the, the vector is obliged, it needs to copy. If you are not sure, you can actually try it. Try it with no accept or without, run it. You would see uh, in a loop, uh, uh, I mean, not in the loop, the loop is in the vector. You do a vector, you create a vector, you push back. At a certain point, the capacity is exhausted and you, you would see a lot of calls to the copy constructor unless you had no accept. If you are not sure, then there is a link down below here. You can go to the link later on and check that. That's true. It would behave like that. So don't forget the no except in case you actually implement your um, move constructor. And this is also a good point to say, implement uh, the move constructor, then consider defaulting or implementing the others. I mean, remember rule of zero, or if I'm not in the rule of zero, then think about the rule of five. Last one, last one. Last chance to gain some points if you uh, count your points on the questions. Uh, are you ready? What's wrong here? There aren't, this is a, an open question. 
it's not a multiple choice. There aren't any uh, answers. You have to think. You may type in what you think, okay? Uh, there is a problem here. Something is not so good. What is the problem? So I see there are a few answers that say the same thing in some kind of a different language, but uh, it, it is it is the same thing. You cannot move from a resource twice. Once it was moved from, you cannot move it again. So here, for some reason, we think that calling the less than operator with uh, temporaries might be more efficient. I don't know, maybe. But then if you call it with a, a stood move and it actually moves inside for some reason, then it invalidates B and A. And then when you actually want to return them, then they might be invalidated. I mean, if you think that there is any reason to, move, to, to do the casting to a value, then it means that it might be that the other side, uh, the less than operator that you are calling, would take advantage of that. So moving twice or moving multiple times the same resource is not a good thing. I mean, you can move and then override the value, but you cannot move and then use the variable as is. The, val the variable is invalidated by now. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. So in order to uh, show the actual problem, I have here the exact same code which says, OK, this is bad. And I want to show you the result here, my string with world, my string with the low. And the maximum is, you can see it here on the right side, an empty string. How come the maximum is an empty string? Who stole my string? What is happening here? OK, let's go up to see what happens in the less than operator. I mean, you called a less than operator. Something may happen there. So for some reason, somebody decided to implement the less than operator taking two R values. These are two R values. And, and, and the implementer decided because it took two R values for some reason. I mean, it, it is the implementer choice to move the arguments into some temporaries and then to do the comparison on the temporaries. Nothing is wrong here. I mean, uh, except for it is not so efficient, but you know, it's the implementer decision. Maybe there is some logic in that. Maybe it needs to do something with the temporaries, etc. So that is something that could have been done. Once you send me uh, an R value, yeah, it could have been stolen. It could have been moved from. And, and then when you go back, A and B by now are moved from which means the, the string is empty. Or it might be that the string is not valid to, to deal with at all. I mean, something that was moved from, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can print it. Here, string allows us to print because it just puts an empty string into the moved from. You shouldn't print it. It could have uh, just crash. So the better way would be you know, to do that uh, suppose that instead we do that, just check and return. So in, in, in this case, we copy. We copy because we return A or B, and, and here we do not have the implicit move on return because we got it as a reference. There is an implicit move also on arguments, but if there are arguments that we got by value. But here we got something as a reference. So since we got it as a reference, we actually do want to move it out when we return. So a better way might be to do the stood forward on the entire expression, which means, okay, do this. And then when you return something, forward it out, which means, okay, if I got them as actual uh, values, if, if the expression here is something that T would accommodate as the t that I got as an R value, then take the expression or, or what I return and do a casting to our value. And here we see that we do call move. Let's go back to the slides. Um, I think that I have till the quarter. 
the 15 minutes, so it might be that I would have some time for questions because this was the last one, but we have still a summary. So to summarize, um, there was a question, in which cases could it be more efficient to compare two forwarded values? I guess ne never. I mean, I don't see any logic in, oh, maybe the comparison would like to copy me or no, the comparison would usually take you as a const f. So why should I bother forwarding? I mean, I would keep the forwarding for the return value in this case. Let's go to the summary. Don't std move anything without thinking. Don't std move local variables or return. I mean, local variables, which are um, not references, and you return them by value. Don't move something that is still in use. Don't move something twice or multiple times or in a loop. On the other end, don't wave std move when needed. You should std move any R value that has a name and you know you won't be using it anymore and thus can move from it. So if it needs a move, do the std move. And you can std move while values if the moved value would not be used, like the example that we had in swap. I mean, don't be too shy of moving L values if you see that you are overriding the value. Oh, so I can, before overriding the value, I need your value, I shouldn't copy, I can move the value from because I'm not using the value, I just override it in a moment, or I, I know that the, the one that sees the variable outside would see the new value that I'm just putting in, like in swap. And that brings me to the last slide. You have my emails down below. If you want to contact me on Incredibuild, Build Acceleration, you have my Incredibuild email, anything else on the presentation or anything, you have also my Gmail, and I'm open for questions as long as we still have time and you have questions. Amir, thank you so much for that uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I haven't seen any questions in the Q&A yet, but I will ask one of my own. I'm not sure if I, I, I have to go out briefly, but what's the difference between stood move and stood forward? Okay, so uh, uh, I, I do see a question in the chat. Okay, I, I would go to the question there in a moment. Um, the question on stood move and stood forward. So um, when I get something, that might be an L, L value or might be an R value, and I want to move from it only if it was an R value, you remember, if I do a std move on an L value, it would cast it to an R value. So you should be very careful if you do not want to move an L value. We, all, we saw that in some cases you do want to move an L value, then you would just call std move. But suppose that I got something that can be an L value or can be an R value. The case is template argument. So I got a template argument, a templated argument uh, on a direct template parameter of my function with a double ref, which means, okay, it's a forwarding reference. It's not necessarily an R value. And again, we didn't discuss how come uh, these forwarding reference came into the language. It is a forwarding reference. It means that it may be an L value or an R value. By the way, it may even be a const L value reference or even a constar value reference. So it can be all four in a templated argument T double ref. In which case, if I want to move only if it is an actual R value, then I would use to forward. That is in fact a conditional move, a conditional move that checks. Is the T that you got is an R value? Uh, in which case uh, it was deduced as an R value. I, I mean, there is some magic inside. The T would just be the type, the double ref, catches the R value, okay, so I want it to be uh, casted to R value. But if I got it as an L value reference, then the T would be deduced to the TL value reference and then stood forward would, would say, no, 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 we are not moving it. There is no casting to R value. You should be L value as we got you. So stood forward should be used in templates, not regularly. And stood move may also be used in templates in case you want to move in any case, I mean, we had a, a swap, swap used templates, but it was a template on L value reference, and we knew that we want to move in any case. Bottom line, 
stood forward, conditional move. Stood move, I actually ask to do casting to our value no matter what. Okay, we have we have two other questions in the live chat, and I'll ask the first one, and maybe the sec we maybe we won't have enough time to do the, the second one, but we can meet in the lounge afterwards. Um, but the first one was from Stefan Walter, and he asks, in which cases would it be more efficient to compare the forwarded values? I guess that's in, in your um, your comparison uh, uh, function that you wrote. Yeah, so I, I do see both questions in the chat. So for the first question, right. I think that I relate, uh, I referenced that during the talk itself. So I saw that and I said, okay, most probably there isn't any uh, viable idea for forwarding into the call to the comparison. So it was just, you know, a toy example. You would not do that. It was for saying, don't do that. And I don't see any reason. Most probably comparison is a non-modifying function. It would just get you as a const ref. So I would say just pass it as is. And the other side would most probably get it as const ref. As for the other uh, question regarding what is the, uh, your take on passing std function as arguments, value, cont, ref, or our value ref. So um, I would take a step back and say, OK, maybe the signature of a function that expects a std function should better be templated, taking the function as a template argument, in which case, if I actually send a pointer to a function or a lambda or uh, a function object, it would not need to convert itself into a std function. It can just be passed as is. And this is more efficient than creating the std function. Now, then, if I need to forward the callable that I got, I mean, I got this function as a t double ref as a forwarding reference to the function, which might be a lambda, might be a pointer to a function, etc. If I just use it, I would just use it. But if I need to forward it, I would use std forward in order to forward it the same way that I got it. So uh, getting a function, usually I would like to get it as a forwarding reference. By the way, it is better than getting it as a const L value reference. Because if I get it as a const L value reference, it might be that the function tries to modify its state, and then I do not allow that. And if I get it as an R value, I actually allow all possible functions, a const function, a non-const function, etc. We can play with this question, I think, if I can share the screen in the lounge. I guess I can. You, you can, yes. We'll do. I think we, we, we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day there uh, because we've, we've been going for one hour. Um, so let's meet in the Track D lounge. Uh, and thank you very much for your great talk. Thank you all. And we will play in the lounge with the question of how would you pass uh, a callable? And we will see that passing it as a uh, uh, forwarding reference and forwarding it is the better choice. Let's do that there. Thank you all. Bye-bye.